Welcome to episode 52 of Amari Purple Talk, a Prince podcast where I share my thoughts on the purple musical singularity. I'm Richard Cole, your imagination funk soloist, and let's dive right on in. And before I get into the topics, I want to remind everyone that the Prince Twitter thread on the album 3121 it's still in effect. If you haven't checked it out, just hit hashtag Prince Twitter thread. Check out all the previous threads. Got two more to go. Uh, this will end on the 19th, which is two more days. So by all means, check it out. Uh, my segment on Black Sweat was last Monday. Uh, that's still up. It's in two parts. By all means, check that out as well. Special shout out and thanks to DJ UMB and Edgar Cruz for inviting me to participate. I had the best time that I've had in a while as a member of the Purple Musical Singularity and looking forward to doing this again at some point. So by all means, again, check it out. Uh, two more songs to go. So we've got actually, let's see, we got three more. So actually three more posts. Uh, today we'll have Pressure Wind 75. Uh, they'll be doing a thread on Beautiful, Loved, and Blessed. We'll have DJ UMB uh, doing the thread on the dance. And Edgar Cruz is going to close us out on the 19th with Get on the Boat. And again, lots of history, lots of great insights. Check it out. This is definitely an album that thanks to listeners of Amari Purple Talk and also one Walter Johnson has actually made me take a deeper dive into this album and I love it even more. And after participating in this thread and reading a lot of the threads by the other contributors, there are certain songs that I love even deeper than I have before. So hopefully that will do the same for you. 3121 it's a 21st century prince classic again hashtag prince twitter thread by all means check it out and lots of your other favorite podcast personalities are also participants as well so if you haven't checked it out check it out so with that being said we're now going to dive into our topics and the first topic today is the I call the estate of the union. Uh, actually, this will be the second chapter of this particular topic. Uh, earlier this year, um, probably not long before the world kind of went crazy on us, but um, there were some things going on with the estate uh, regarding a couple of family members. Uh, first, uh, Tyka Nelson made a deal with the company uh, that specializes in celebrity branding, and that is celebrity branding of both living and dead celebrities. Um, made a deal to get some money because basically there's money being made by the estate, but this money has not found its way to the family members of Prince as of yet. Uh, there was also questions brought up after the passing of Alfred Jackson, uh, another Prince sibling, uh, where his family was calling into question uh, some contesting, I guess, the will because he too also made deals outside of, I guess, Comerica Bank and the estate and basically these deals were for to like I said to get some money and you know there's also been some I guess splitting within the camp uh, certain family members want to go in one direction other family members want to go in a different direction and pretty much having a hard time being on the same page but the common denominator is that none of them at this point outside of any separate business deals that have been made 
again there's no money actually coming into the estate so what I'm calling attention to this episode uh, was based on a Twitter post made by Sharon L. Nelson. Uh, this was from August 4th. So I'm going to start off by reading what was said in the Twitter post. And what Sharon L. Nelson says in this post, uh, she says, I need help, America. Prince's estate is drowning in poor business decisions by Comerica Bank and the judge grants all business decisions. Okay, so I'm going to say it one more time. I need help America. Prince's estate is drowning in poor business decisions by Comerica Bank and the judge grants all business decisions. Okay, so prior to this post uh, there was an item that had been leaked out to the press uh, regarding this situation that entities within Comerica Bank are making these business decisions that the judge is approving apparently or allegedly apparently allegedly is granting these decisions regarding any decisions made by Comerica Bank in regards to things regarding the estate. So basically, I guess if somebody came up with an idea for, say, I don't know, just pulling something out the air, a Prince animated series, then Comerica, you know, they're not looking at it like, well, this would be a great idea, you know. It's a sound idea. It makes sense. It's something that Prince would have wanted. Or it's something that the family wants to do. But no, it's, you know, hey, Prince animated series. Say, Judge, can we do a Prince animated series? Judge says, sure, grant it. And it's done. And whether that was a good idea or not, now, I'm just making this up. There is no Prince animated series coming. I'm just using this as an example. But ideas are being approved. And obviously there's money that's being made. Or there may be not necessarily money being made. It could be, if in the right hands, a good idea or a great idea or even a bad idea can generate millions and millions of dollars but instead maybe this decision isn't instead of hundreds of millions maybe it's only making tens of millions or a couple of million or a million or less and basically you know a bank doesn't isn't necessarily in the entertainment business let alone a bank is not in the music business now, a bank can facilitate, say, if you want to make a major motion picture and either you're the studio or you go to the studio or whoever's going to finance this film, they're not going to dig deep into their own pockets to do it. They're going to make a loan. So whoever makes the loan, now the bank would function as a lender in that but they're not necessarily the ones that are going to be making the creative or marketing decisions. You know, that is up to the studio or that is up to the creator that's borrowing the money in that. All they care about is, are we going to make our money back plus the interest that we're, you know, putting on this loan? You know, that's all that they care about, really. But... This is one of the pitfalls of not having a will in place is that now this is a situation where this is a bank that's been assigned by the courts or approved by the courts on behalf of Prince's family to make sound, solid, profitable business decisions 
And here we are, we're four going into five years since Prince's passing. And yes, money is coming in. You know, there's reissues, there's box sets, deluxe editions, you know, videos that are still selling, you know, Purple Rain still playing on television, you know, on whether it's a local station or a cable station, it's still playing. You know, they're still licensing things for whatever, advertisements. You know, there's been a serious XM channel, though not permanent as of now, but they've kind of dipped their toe in the water twice. And hopefully, inevitably, that would be something that would happen and again, generate further income. And I know for certain that everyone within the purple musical singularity, and that includes us as the fan base, and mainly that's what I'm talking about here, is the fan base. Everyone has a certain opinion. And that's fine. It's okay to have an opinion. I'm just a podcast host, you know, basically a purple pundit, really. You know, um, I have some knowledge of the music industry. There are people um, that I respect that have their own shows that have a little bit more musical or music industry knowledge than I do. And I, you know, take cues from them and their experience and their understanding. But at the end of the day, we all have a certain bit of insight as to how the music business of this works. And then there are people that, granted, you know, have no understanding of the music business or, you know, have certain... I should say loyalties to Prince to where it's, you know, well, why are they, they shouldn't get any, or why are they doing, you know, let's put all that to rest. And I've covered this on previous topics before. The bottom line is this, basically, you know, and this is a topic that none of us ever really want to deal with, and especially a situation where now You're in a position to make decisions in which millions of dollars are at stake. None of us, or at least not a lot of us, have ever been in that position. It's hard enough dealing with it, you know, if somebody says they they leave a house to you or, you know, they leave a few bucks to you or something that's hard enough to deal with to, you know, to then start to make those decisions. Now you're talking about millions of dollars and yet it's easy to sit here and play sort of armchair quarterback and say, Oh, you should do this and you should do that. Um, But why this subject is being tackled this week, it's basically because Apparently, the frustrations are so deep or they run so deep that at the time that this Twitter post was made, there was no nowhere else to turn. You know, there's no one else to trust. You know, they put their trust in this Comerica Bank to do the right thing and to ensure the financial security that's been, you know, that's been thrust upon this family's shoulders. And to sit back, you know, and whether, you know, I don't know what their individual positions are, but say if that was me and I'm sitting there and, well, let's just say if it was me and I am going to my essentially non-essential, essential job every day, to keep a roof over my head, to eat, support my family, all of that. And here I had a sibling that was one of the most famous people on the planet, didn't leave a will, 
but it's now up to me to make those decisions. And I'm trusting an entity approved by the courts to do that. And I'm watching, you know, I'll just say, hey, I'm sitting back watching the 1999 Super Deluxe sell like hotcakes. You know, I'm watching other albums. The streams are going up the roof after a Grammy tribute performance. And I'm watching these millions of people celebrating that sibling and supporting that sibling's creative work based on decisions that I may or may not have been privy to and the checks are rolling in but yet nothing's going into the direct deposit at my bank you know that's the thing to think about like I said a lot of us don't you know we all have loved ones that have either already passed or you know we have people that we're just going to hate to see that day come when that inevitability happens and again to be thrust with those decisions just as quote unquote ordinary people that's hard enough so again to sit there and play armchair quarterback when it's not your sibling that's changed the course of music history and it's now on your shoulders and neither you know none of the other siblings have had any real dealings with the music business so they don't have the business experience or know-how or they would have been able to navigate this a lot easier despite having no will so for someone with nowhere to turn to put a post and put this question out to people that she doesn't even know but knows deep down of the love and respect and care that we've had for Prince's career and the massive support, regardless of what era you're a fan of, you know, whether it's the 80s, you going out and buying that 1999 Super Deluxe Edition, you're going out to buy that Sign of the Times Super Deluxe Edition when it drops. 3121 may have been your gateway album or even just your favorite album to you. So that's, she's turning to us for an answer. And I kind of looked a day or two after, and there weren't a lot of, because again, like I said, none of us, you know, have been part of the music business to the magnitude of Prince to know what to do or what to say, you know. So I kind of looked and, you know, I didn't see any comments. Now, I don't know if she got any private messages or anything that, you know, extended an offer for help or, you know, hell, I wish I was in a position to offer some services. But, you know, like I said, I my music industry experience is very little, you know, but. I did make a suggestion that, or well, not a suggestion, but a recommendation uh, that the estate should call Janie Hendrix. You know, it's uh, Jimi Hendrix's uh, younger half sister, uh, Jimi Hendrix's father. Now, at first, I thought Jimi had a will. But as I started doing more research, it appears that he didn't have a will either. But at some point after some mishandling of a lot of Jimmy's music, where other entities were reaping the benefits, Hendrix's father sued. Now, it took a little over 20 years, about 25 years to accomplish it. But he sued and won the rights to Prince's music. And basically, you know, again, here's a sibling, I mean, not a sibling, but a family member, a parent that had no music industry experience, but was smart enough to successfully sue and win. And the only other family member that he could trust was his daughter, 
Janie. Now, Hendrix does have a brother, too. But the thing was, you know, he got caught up in a lot of drugs and stuff, and they probably felt like he would just squander everything away. Now, the brother also sued the estate, but that was settled out of court. But again, I urge everyone, and like I said, I, this is like a broken record for me always comparing the two. Hence, when you see the in-show graphic, you see I got the picture of Hendrix, and I got Prince kind of listening <laughs> in the picture. But I urge everyone to just look at what they've been able to accomplish as Experience Hendrix LLC. Take a look at since 1996 when they had a licensing deal with MCA Records, the reissues of Jimmy's three original albums with the Experience, the Band of Gypsies, and all the vault stuff that has come out since box sets compilations live albums live dvds documentaries you know the merchandising and they also have a subsidiary that facilitates the release of well-known or lesser known bootlegged material where they're taking a cue from frank zappa where it's like, okay, this is a bootleg that's widely that's in wide circulation, but the quality just isn't up to snuff. But hey, we're just going to put this out because that's for the hardcore fan. And the hardcore fan can pay a decent price for it. And the money goes to Experience Hendrix LLC. Yeah, so there was a person on Twitter um, that basically responded to my comment and the gist of it is that you know Janie Hendrix is only a half sister and she wasn't that close to Jimmy and you know and again you know armchair quarterback you know look <laughs> family alright so what you're saying is that ooh just because she's a half-sister and they weren't that close, that she's not entitled. This was the person that the father, the only family member that he could trust to run the business. Then this cat brings me some stuff about Paul Allen, the big guy with Microsoft, used to own the Portland Trail Blazers and is a huge Hendrix fan. He passed away in 2018, God rest his soul. But He's a super Hendrix fan and apparently brought up some evidence of where I think where there was some legal disputes uh, regarding other entities, maybe as well as the other brother as well. But this Paul Allen stepped in and helped finance the legal fees. Well, my response to that is good for Paul Allen. Good for him. You know, probably the second richest person under Bill Gates, you know, worked with Bill Gates at Microsoft, owns the Portland Trail Blazers, which I'm not a huge fan, but I do I do enjoy watching them play and I do respect their success. And you can just Google him and look at the rest of his resume. You know, it's amazing. And the man is such a huge Hendrix fan that he, you know, excelled at his own guitar skills and even put out an album that's really respected which I haven't had a chance to listen to yet but I'll check it out based on the critical response of it so what it doesn't matter and what you're saying again just because this is a half sister and they weren't that close well Prince wasn't that close to his family. I mean, he hadn't talked to a lot of them in a long time. Does that mean that they're not entitled to it? You know, hell, if Amari Communications, you know, or myself, does something of 
huge significance that it brings in a significant sum that just because there's family members I haven't spoken to in a, a while for whatever reason that they're not entitled to something. You know, look, Prince didn't have any children. You know, I do. So there's a fundamental difference right there. But if he had, then this this would not be a discussion except that to the fact that those children, well, if he had them, maybe there would have been a will. But since there wasn't one, and yeah, he probably couldn't decide who should get what based on that decision alone. But let's just say that I myself didn't. I have half siblings. And again, they're not entitled to something just because we don't call each other every day. You know, get out of it. And what is that saying to the prince estate? And how is that helping them? How, you know, what you're saying, and then you beefing up this Paul Allen like he's Jesus. You know, it's like, so what you're saying is that basically this family should just sell out to a big corporate entity to come in and swoop in and save the day. My only issue with that is, you know, Tom Petty's family was squabbling. You know, what, did a big corporation come and swoop in and pay legal fees? No, they settled their stuff and worked it out. You know, yeah, uh, some big, huge corporation had to bail out Elvis. Yeah, Elvis was making some money or he made more money after he died. But the reason that Elvis as a brand is worth a billion dollars was because of some corporate interference. But I don't give a fuck about Elvis right now. So my point is when it comes to black entertainers. So it's Jimi Hendrix and it's OK for a big, huge corporation. Never mind. I get it. Paul Allen's a Prince fan and I'm not trying to bring up anything, you know, kind of off topic. But, you know, but you're trying to paint Janie Hendrix as like this bad, evil person because she's a half sibling. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Experience Hendrix LLC was running pretty well. There's only so much money you're going to get off of record sales and DVD sales and the Experience Hendrix tour. You know, there's only so much. So when you're faced with a lawsuit of any kind, doesn't matter who you are, unless you are Paul Allen or Bill Gates or Steve Jobs to where you have more money than God. To where, you know, legal fees are chump change. But despite the millions that experience Hendrix LLC was making in the face of the type of lawsuits. Good. Paul Allen was a super fan. I get that. I get that. And good for him that he reached out of at least we hope out of the kindness of his heart. But I don't see anything to where. Experience Hendrix LLC was set up as a dummy company because he didn't factor until these lawsuits took place. You know, and then on this whole thing of, you know, reissues that were in the hands of Alan Douglas, we're not going to get into that because this is not a Hendrix podcast, it's a Prince podcast. But I will say this Alan Douglas, yes, was a controversial figure in Hendrix's history. But according to Chaz Chandler, out of Hendrix's own mouth, Hendrix said it's cool that Alan Douglas handles the business aspect, but he didn't want that man anywhere near his music, period. And yeah, early 90s, I had all three Hendrix albums on CD and considering where CD technology was in the early 90s. What's the point? What is the point? But I did buy just about, just about, not everything, but just about everything that Experience Hendrix LLC has put out since they acquired the rights in 96. And by the time we got to the late 90s, there's 20 bit remastering, there's 24 bit remastering technology. Not that it makes every single CD sound perfect or better. 
but music is subjective and what you like cool I might not like it you know what I like you may not like it but I have no opinion on the official Hendrix albums as far as are you experienced acts as bold as love band of gypsies electric ladyland I have no issue with those when I had those in the early 90s I had a Fisher boombox and I can't remember the type of CD it was one of it was the I got it in 87 as a birthday present uh, I was a CD player that and I just used the RCA jacks to plug into the Fisher boombox and to me everything sounded great even the Beatles CDs which that CD quality until their 2009 remasters was crappy but it didn't matter I had the Beatles on CD and I also get that there were people that bought post or posthumous releases from Hendrix in the 70s that Alan Douglas was a part of and those things are a dividing line between that fan base the people that bought it and loved it they loved it the people like that were in the know didn't care for it they didn't care for the outside overdubs with people that had no dealings with Hendrix in any way shape or form never recorded with him and granted Mitch Mitchell signed off on some of the stuff Alan Douglas had done but that's his opinion but at the end of the day what is any of that have to do with the Prince estate beyond hell let's sell it out to a big huge corporation and if you do pray to God that they are a Prince fan just like the rest of us and that they're doing it out of the kindness and care of their own hearts otherwise this becomes the same story that happens to everybody Ray Charles James Brown Sam Cooke Michael Jackson Prince Bob Marley you know and every black entertainer that changed the course of music from the 50s on up to now it's the same sad story you know again we don't hear this with Tom Petty we don't hear this with Frank Zappa we don't hear this with Bob Dylan we don't we don't have that uh, Zappa's family yeah they beefed you know but no big corporations coming in to swoop you know and and save the day for them but lo and behold you know, let's come in and quote unquote save the black entertainer. You know, so again, that, like I said, how is that helping at the end of the day the concerns of the Prince estate? And again, like I said, I don't have the answers. And everybody in the purple musical singularity is going to have their opinion. You know, but all of that to say. You know, I wish them well. I wish I was in a position to help. Um, I don't know. I throw out an idea every now and then. I don't know if it's a great idea. Like I said, handling the gold experience. You know, I've done several episodes regarding what to do with that in the face of the lawsuit dealing with the most beautiful girl in the world, you know, having to omit that on any future release you know I've got ideas a lot of my fellow podcasters have ideas you know so again you know if we can offer our services we can offer our help you know will they bring in millions of dollars I mean we hope so we like to think every good idea is a great idea sometimes that's not the case but You know, if you bring it up, Paul Allen, Paul Allen's been dead for two years. So I don't see how he's going to come in and swoop in and save the Prince estate. You know, again, that made no absolutely no sense whatsoever. And as far as for, like I said, making the recommendation to call, it's not for her, Janie Hendricks, to come in and save the Prince estate. That's not what I was bringing up. The thing is, is that that's somebody who in dealing 
with the loss of a legend. You know, has the experience of the ups and downs and the legal wrang wranglings and the, the lawsuits and the this and the that. And for somebody having to have well over 25 years of experience dealing with that. Yeah, that's the shoulder. You, that's the shoulder to cry to. That's the that's the person to call not to come in and save the day. But first and foremost that can listen and understand because again you know i'm i would be too attached to it you know it's like click click let me in the vault okay we're putting this out we're putting this out and we're putting it if it doesn't make dollars it won't make sense but that's somebody you can talk to You know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Frank Zappa's family currently. I know that Tom Petty's family did resolve their differences, uh, allowing one of uh, his vault albums to come out finally. Maybe that's somebody you can talk to, too, as well. But the one thing that I do know is that. Even if Prince was wrestling with the idea of who to leave it to since he did not have children of his own, the one thing that he was cognizant of was that it was very important for him to retain total ownership of his work. So therefore, if any family member, sibling or descendant, siblings, descendants, generations of Nelsons, to come that they receive the lion's share of the winnings and that's what was most important to Prince regardless of whether he was aware of that decision or didn't want to think about that decision in current time you know what did matter was that he owned it and the end result of whatever family or descendants that were going to reap the benefits he put things into position to where that could happen and so that's the thing that's important again we can all sit here and play armchair quarterback all day but at the end of the day, like I said, the vast majority of us aren't ever in the position to make those type of family decisions when there's millions of dollars at stake. So consider that and put yourself in their shoes next time before making a comment. And at the same time as well, Prince's endgame was not for his creative works to end up lost in the shuffle of corporate conglomerates. Again, look at Sam Cooke, follow the money. You know, look at James Brown, follow the money. You know, there's so, so many that, you know, have ended up in this game with nothing. You know, but like I said, meanwhile, you got look at the, you know, look at the Beatles. I mean, Paul made the decision. He made the smart move. I'm going to sue my three best friends to save us all. And even though they didn't get it at the time, when the money started rolling in, then it was like, oh, thank you, Paul. Yeah, well, OK, we, we get it now. We see what you did. There. OK. All right. And. They're all still cool with one another to this day. You know, Paul and John reconciled their differences before John passed. But, you know, again, you don't see the Beatles stuff all caught up. You know, every deal that they make, it's a deal to where it puts a fair. And that's the key. Fair amount of millions into their pockets, into their children's pockets from Julian to Sean to Danny to Zach to 
you know, um, even Stella, even though she don't really need it, she's a big fashion guru, but still, you know, uh, Mary, James, Heather, you know, that's going to go into their pockets as well. So, so that is my reaching out to the family of the Prince Estate and saying, hey, you know, like I said, I don't have all the answers, but like I said, that was a recommendation and also a vent because, you know, that response about this Paul Allen and I'm like, who? <laughs> and then Alan Douglas and then trying to get me to sign off on the fact that the pressings prior to 20 bit and 24 bit remastering and the fact that LLC experience Hendrix LLC is re that's the whole point the family gets the lion's share of that money leave you you know whatever your personal feelings about it at the end of the day the money's supposed to go into the pockets of the family regardless so that's that so but what's most important is what do you guys think um, have you seen this post uh, do you think that there is some way you can help or you know because she turned to America she didn't turn to anybody else but I mean you know as far as Prince fans we're all over the planet we're all over the globe so you know if somebody has some insights or some recommendations um, by all means you know if you follow any of the family members on Twitter Drop them a personal message if you can or, you know, shout it to the rafters in your Twitter thread. You know what can be done, you know, because we want the print stuff to keep coming and we want to keep dropping our purple ducats and supporting it and hoping that one day that money will go into their pockets. But also to leave me a comment and let me know. And again, thanks for letting me vent that one out because I needed to get that one out big time. And now we're going to actually move on to something more pleasant and more positive situation here. And we're going to do the purple spotlight. We haven't done it in a while. I uh, used to focus on uh, associated artist or individual that has had an influence on Prince's life and then we kind of switched it to key albums and this time yep we're going to focus on a couple of albums one is the Prince album and the other is a protege act uh, first I want to talk about the come album because uh, yesterday was the anniversary of its release way back in 1994 and basically this was kind of an album that really I have been looking forward to since 1993 um, like I said at that point uh, I had made like about two or three trips to Minneapolis actually and that year 1993 that year I went to the Minneapolis uh, Music Expo for the first. Yeah, it was the first time. Not might have been the second time. I can't remember, but I remember going, and I got to go to like maybe a couple of more events than the previous one. And also, I used to have family out there. Actually, I still have one relative uh, still out there. But um, you know, like I said, it was cool. Just get to go hang out and. You know, they take me to the Mall of America and, you know, sometimes I get to venture out and hit a club or two or something. But, you know, I was all really great vacations up there. And uh, I, might, I can't remember what record store. It might have been Electric Fetus. Oh, I can't remember. Or it might have even been the NPG Music Store. But anyway, long story short, I picked up an issue of Controversy magazine and that's uh, it actually issue 42 and that is the issue 
with the famous letter from Maite, you know, kind of nudging about the, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge about the name change and what's going on. And, you know, he, Prince isn't going to record anymore he's retired from the studio he's just going to give folk stuff from the vault but he did write a bunch of songs they all had one word titles and i was like wow that's amazing and you know and those titles come and dark and race papa all of those and the pope of course that was on the pope was on hits and the b-sides and so was peach too so those in fact Actually, that week was the first time I heard um, Pink Cashmere, and it was on the radio out there. And, you know, so that kind of, you know, and then eventually I got the hits in the B-side. So the mystery behind Peach and Pope had been eliminated at that point. But the rest of the titles was like, wow, you know, I wonder what those sound like. And finally, we get to kind of like spring in early summer of 94 and I tell you there was a few things I think if I if I got the chronology right uh, let's see that spring was Prince's appearance on Soul Train so that was pretty hype you know to catch that and then I think like a month or so later was the issue of vibe when he was on the cover in that interview and in that interview it was talk about the come album and the gold experience and you know reading that interview and it was kind of like giving a little insight on to you know the name change and it's like oh you know he's battling with warner brothers you know or the battle is going to the next level at this point And it was just like, oh, and then in that article, they talk about how Prince played the Come album and kind of that interviewer's, um, you know, initial responses to it and how Prince spent more time playing the Gold Experience. And it was like, oh, I want to hear both of these, you know, but within like a couple of months of me reading that Vibe interview, then um, in between there, Let It Go was released as a single And that was back in August. That was the 9th. And then the Come album came out a few weeks later on the 16th of August. And, you know, granted, based on the interview, kind of going in, that this was obviously contract obligation. But I'll tell you, I enjoyed that when I got that album, I enjoyed it a lot more than I would really thought. I would. I mean, even to this day, I'm not really knocked out by the album cover, but I get it because I get what was going on at that time and the motivation behind it. And that, yes, he was no longer Prince at this point. So, again, this is, you know, the thing It's like, oh, it's stuff from tech. Well, it wasn't quite stuff from the vault at this point, but get kind of the idea. But this was a pretty solid album. I think, you know, had there not been this issue with Warner Brothers, you know, I think that if enough, like if there were a few more songs on it and it had like maybe a different cover or something else going on and that the gold experience wasn't a factor, then to me, I think this would have been one of Prince's better albums of the 90s. I know that kind of goes to the gold experience, um, but this one... The more I think about it, I would have to put this in my top five of his best 90s output because it's solid. You know, again, it's contract obligation, but it's pretty solid for contract obligation. Not quite like the vault old friends for sale, uh, which I listened to again this morning. And I have a little bit better feeling about that than I had in the past. But. To me, pound uh, pound for pound, come was the best album to me out of those two. If you're going to talk about contract obligation, you know. But I, got, I remember getting this CD, and as customary then, because I only you know back in those days you only had cassettes, 
in cars in those days. So I would just, you know, make a dub onto a cassette tape. And God, you know, I think I that stayed in heavy rotation. You know, uh, what was I still bumping at that time? Uh, shoot, 94. Oh, shoot, probably uh, Ice Cube, Scarface. Uh, let's see. Maybe Tupac still at that point. I can't remember, but within that, those four that I would bump in the ride, yeah, definitely come was in the heavy rotation uh, along with those. I mean, I it really I never really left the title track because I mean that bass was just amazing. That doom, 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 doom. you know whether that's Prince or whether that's Sonny T. Either way, man, that that had me right there. And to me, I really enjoyed this album more than I enjoyed the Symbol album. You know, because um. I don't know. That left me a little flat in places, or I should say I had higher hopes for that album. But to me, even though Come was contract obligation, that album just really, you know, it resonated. Because I think for me, the best is always, you know, if Prince kept it simple with just a couple of people, you know, depending on what band, but mostly... You know, if he's not utilizing one or two different people, it's always, you know, the written, produced, performed and arranged by Prince. To me, that's the better feel. But yeah, I like I said, I never really would leave the title track. You know, I actually would play that two or three times if I'm, you know, depending on how far I was driving to a place. Then, you know, I'll let it ride out from there because, I mean, I love Let It Go. So based on that, I'm like, well, if this is contract obligation, Whew. yeah give me more <laughs> so i love the single you know that was a little bit of a little bit of g-funk kind of a thing happening and i love the remixes too to that but you know I, like i said i would let the rest of it play and then there would be you know space would be the next track and i love that that was to me like you know Prince doing like a radio friendly track, but it was a better radio friendly track than anything that was radio friendly at that time for me, you know, and I love the lyrics to it, too. So, I mean, then there was Space, Fermone, uh, which was the instrumental part that was the theme for Video LP back in the day on BET. Uh, which was cool because, you know, first you had like Jesse had done the theme for Video Soul. And then you get into like the 90s. And then here comes Prince doing something for BET also. I thought that was like, you know, that was the coolest thing for me to hear. And, you know, Loose was a song like I love it now, better now. And for a while... I like the version on Crystal Ball better. But having listened to this again recently, to me, this is the better one. It's stronger. It's edgier. Uh, it's the, atti the attitude is heavier on it. And I enjoy that. You know, Race is a pretty good song. Dark is pretty good. That one, I kind of go back and forth between this version and the version that's on Crystal Ball. And again, let it go, you know, and orgasm. I mean, even that one, just based on, you know, now that I know the history of how this song was or how that was recorded and what elements were a part of that, I was like, you know, wow. And I one day want to, you know, if they ever do like a compilation, if they just put the elements of poem, the, you know, just release it in its entirety as a single track instead of the segues that were on this album that is something that I definitely want to hear um, now for the actual history or some facts about this album check out the Violet Realities post uh, it's titled come 1984 the facts that you didn't know and it's on YouTube I got a link in the show notes here by all means check that out um, very informative 
stuff on this album, uh, how it was recorded, and you know, just opinions on some of the songs. But it's definitely the facts that you didn't know. There were facts I didn't know. So check it out. And so from there, we are now going to move on to something else that was released uh, way back in the day, uh, a little bit earlier in the week. Uh, but this is also an anniversary for the Families album as well. And let's see, and actually I might be a couple of days early on that. So August 19th is the is listed here as the official release. So August 19th of 1985. So we've got that anniversary coming up for the family. And this is as far as like associated artists. Oh, this is like in my top five favorite, you know, sort of non-Prince albums. You know, I mean, it's Prince related, but and at the same time, this is the best Prince album that Prince didn't put his vocals to. And, you know, actually between this album and the Come album, there should just be Prince music that should just come out in August. You know, for no particular reason. You know, it's kind of like closer to the end of the summer. And, you know, you just still feel in the vibe. You're rolling into September a little bit and you're still vibing off of summer and you know just having some great music to be your background or your soundtrack to your life you know there should be like just vault music that's funky and deep and you know a couple of good ballads here and there that should just come out on august in august so you know prince estate there's a there's another idea i don't know if it'll make money but you know, if you think that would make money, there's an idea you can have for free. But the the family, I know since uh, the departure of Jam and Lewis from the time, that was like, you know, because really by what time is it album? Yeah, it, it had been decided that is my favorite band period for my generation. Um, you know, I'd always been a big Parliament Funkadelic fan cameo lakeside so those are sort of my bands of the moment zap big time um those were sort of my bands for the moment but you know the first time album sort of put them in that sort of top five top ten list of favorite bands but it was what time is it that just kind of put everything to the top you know like, uh, this is it. This is my favorite band, hands down, for my generation, you know, that's not name Sly and the Family Stone and not name the Beatles. This is, you know, boom, this is my favorite band right here. So when that when they sort of disbanded and. You know, I kind of had to like, oh, let me go find another favorite band. And then like the deal came out, like I think that was sort of like late 83. And I mean, Body Talk was all right. And I dug the ballad, Just My Luck. But it, it just wasn't enough to say, OK, they're replacing the time as my favorite band. But when the Family album came out, then that was it. The void was filled for me right there. You know, it wasn't deep funk, you know, deep, heavy funk like the time, but it had those elements and the addition of Eric Leeds and the saxophone kind of put it to a different level. Didn't say better, but it put it to a different level to where it's like, OK, they're their own group on their own terms. You know, it's a different style. You know, different aesthetic, but they still bring in the funk, you know, high fashion, mutiny. They had a powerhouse single with uh, Screams of Passion. And I mean, you know, that single, just hearing it on the radio was was great to hear. Seeing the video, you know, that was a cool little video uh, for back then. 
and you know just everything was in place and this was the album i mean i really wanted this album to go somewhere you know um and then kind of as time went by it was a thing of yeah you had screams of passion that was the single and i know i was patiently waiting to see like well what's the next single and i think high fashion was the next one out but it didn't do as well as screams of passion did and it was just like, oh, you know, nobody's really checking for this album, you know, and it's like I'm, you know, I've got it in heavy rotation. I literally not carried it everywhere I went, uh, but, you know, there were friends, you know, they're um, friends of ours. Um, their mom was uh, Fontella Bass, you know, of Rescue Me fame. And uh, my cousin was going with one of her daughters and you know i would always tag along and everything you know great you know great family great people to visit and stuff and that was the album i just carried it over there for no real reason because we would just hang out you know she let us hang out there and play cards and you know she'd fix us something to eat if you know if we didn't bring over a pizza or something like that and you know, it was just real fun, you know, so I just, you know, just have something to listen to, you know, while we're playing board games or playing cards or something. And, you know, so kind of, again, you know, there's that, again, that August kind of feel, you know, you're hanging out and got some good music playing, you know, they kind of got into it a little bit. And, but like I said, you know, the rest of, you know, St. Louis just really wasn't checking for this album and it was kind of a disappointment that it just wasn't getting up there, but, you know, I enjoyed it. And, you know, a couple of friends of mine that, you know, also musicians, you know, we enjoyed it as an album. You know, we thought this is great. You know, actually there was a friend of ours um, that he was a drummer in another band. Actually it was his band. He was the leader also. Um, but, you know, we all went to, you know, college together and stuff. And we hung out and stuff. And, you know, we'd always beg him for rides to... There was a store, uh, kind of like a little convenience store or whatever. Uh, but they also had magazines in it. And they also had comic books, too. And, you know, we'd always beg him to drive us up there, you know, during lunch <laughs> and stuff. You know, we'd look, we'll pay you. You know, here's a couple of bucks, you know. And, you know, he would drive us up there. So one time, you know, we're driving up there and you know he's got the family playing in the car and the song yes and we just kind of in that moment because you know he was listening for the drums because that's one hell of a drum beat that's going on in that and you know he's sort of like ah, wait wait listen and he's air drumming the boom boom ba -dum, boom boom you know and from that point on for me you know as i'm writing songs later at that time that's something i took quite a bit of notice of um just how he was listening to the song and by you know just p isolating that part you know it's just like oh okay so i kind of learned to listen a little bit better especially drums that way because i'm not a drummer i wanted to when i was a kid and i had like maybe half a lesson or so as a drummer but you know like I said writing songs you know it's kind of important like well how do you want this to go you know where do you want the drums to fall in the arrangement of your song you know you don't want them all over the place but you know just those little nuances so from that point you know we learn to sort of listen like that too and kind of isolate the beat or you know even isolate because you know beyond your own instrument you know, because if you're learning it, you know, the guitar part, you know, as I was or the bass part like I was, then, of course, it's easy to isolate those parts. But when you're composing, then all the parts, you know, you have to be aware of, you know, and, you know, forget this is sort of the debut of Claire Fisher arrangements within the realm of the purple musical singularity also and you know like i'm you know huge beatles fan so i'm aware of what george martin's arrangements 
mean to certain Beatle tracks. So with Claire Fisher, in this case, starting off with The Family and then Parade, that sort of became his George Martin equivalent as far as string arrangements with that and the p absolute perfect fit. You know, when you listen to Screams of Passion, and if you're hearing it for the first time, I envy your journey because, you know, for me hearing it, it's like, oh, this is different. It's, you know, you got the signature Prince originality, you know, just because, you know, you got the drums, that minimalist thing, um, you know, since when Doves cried that he was so known, f you know, was so known for. So you've got that sort of beat. You got a little bit of a bass going on in it. But then it's the strings that punctuate every single thing that goes on in that track from the instruments to even the vocals. You know, Claire knew exactly where to place those notes. And I mean, it's just it's it's phenomenal to listen to. And I mean, even the rest of it, Desire, you know, is another example. And again, you know, this is sort of the debut of Eric Leeds, you know, even though he was kind of on the fringes, you know, like if you look at the Purple Rain concert, you know, he's on the fringes because for a while, you know, we're all thinking Eddie M was going to be the guy on the sax, you know, but, you know, Eric Leeds, you know, sort of became the Maceo equivalent, you know, as far as the late 80s. And some of the 90s go, you know, Eric Leeds became the guy on the sax. And uh, what is that? Um, I mean, mutiny. I mean, high fashion, you know, the way he comes in at the end of that mutiny, you know, that sort of like little soloing or riffing at the end, you know, with the whole voice did you give, you know, that those elements. And then there's that little knock towards Morris Day because he jumped ship. You know, so it was great. And I remember also taking a video production class and one of the assignments was putting together a talk show, you know, so we learned how to actually put together a talk, you know, and I was hard pressed to come up with, you know, a theme for it, you know, because I, I don't think I had a lot of records that had, you know, instrumentals that would fit you know, kind of the concept of the talk show that we put together as a class. But, um, you know, I stumbled across Susanna's Pajamas and that was a, the perfect track to do that. And I wish I had could find that, talk, you know, that tape somewhere. I don't know if they keep an archive. I'm going to have to look into that. But, you know, when I presented that to the teacher, like, hey, look, this is going to be the theme song for this. And, you know, I played it to him. And, you know, I mean, his toe was tapping and he was just into it. And I eventually made him a cassette, you know, the entire album with it. But I mean, he just loved that track, you know, and. You know, it's just so many different elements, you know, um, you know, I've got a friend that likes desire, you know, just because of the sort of slight nod to reggae, you know, it's a little bit of a reggae element in there. You know, and it's, you know, that's one, you know, kind of for me in those days, you know, I would listen to an album and there were certain albums where, yeah, of course, the hits, you know, you bought it for the hit of the single or a couple of singles that were the hits from it. But there were certain albums that in addition to those, you know, the first couple of album cuts that are on it. And then it's like, upon hearing those, they automatically become your favorites. And then you kind of listen to the rest of the album like, oh, that's OK. You know, that's good. You know, it's nothing that where it's like it's an obvious miss for it. But then, you know, a couple of months, three months, four months, six months goes by. And it's a good enough album that you play from beginning to end. And then the sort of cuts that you kind of overlooked when you first got it because you jazzed on the hits and then there were those two or three other cuts that just grabbed your attention immediately. Then you go, oh, this is nice, you know, and desire is one of those that, 
did that. And then two, Susanna's Pajamas, that one too. And I think just off the strength of putting together that talk show for class, that was a good one. You know, that was another one that is like, oh, yeah, this is a pretty good track. I do like that one. You know, um, I kind of liked it better than Yes. I mean, and not that Yes was a bad one. You know, it was good. But like I said, there was that when the album was fresh and, you know, the bit of the air drum listening lesson <laughs> there, then for me, Suzanne, it just flows a little bit better for me. But as as an, an entire album, it's great, you know. And again, to me, if there was no Around the World in a Day, and it was Prince putting this album out. I, you know, I think it would have been a stronger, more artistic statement if he released it himself. You know, I think, I don't know. I, I just had that feeling if he had actually put this album out himself and, you know, Lord knows what else would have been added to it or what would have been B-sides to the singles. But, I mean, this really would have been, I think, a lot stronger than Around the World in a Day. I think the reception would have been a lot stronger than Around the World in a Day. But, you know, that's a quantum realm question that one day we'll explore. But for now, what do you guys think? Um, the Come album, the Family album... Both of those, are they in your top 10 of favorites? Do you prefer one over the other? Um, what memories do you have associated with either one? Leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. Okay, and that is going to end this episode of Amari Purple Talk. Thanks again for listening to me rant on the first topic. And hopefully you enjoyed the final topic as well. And also, again, reminder, check out the Prince Twitter thread, 3121. You know, everybody put their heart and soul. Everybody did their homework, their research. And, you know, put out some very heavy, entertaining and on point threads. Check it out again. Thanks again for inviting me to participate and look forward to doing even more in the future. So. In addition to that, be sure to come back here every Monday for Amari Purple Talk. Also, follow me on Twitter at RichardCo underscore now and on Instagram at RichardCo underscore Amari. Also, check out my track reaction to Witness for the Prosecution version 2. I thought I was going to get a break from reaction videos but no <laughs> so Warner Brothers could you like wait maybe like a week or two before you put out another single so that way I can kind of get some rest after I do this show because I'm going to go record that reaction right now so by all means definitely check out that reaction video check out my website AmariCommunications.com and check out my blog What's in the Crate and I am working on new blogs so I know I keep saying that every week but I am almost halfway done with the Revolver blog and immediately after that I'm going to work on the Sign of the Times one and that's it so thanks for tuning in and always keep it purple and on the one.